Good day, folks. It's good to be here with you. And again and again, I say thank you for inviting me into your places and your spaces. I hope you've had a, a great week uh, here in uh, our part of central Alberta. Things are getting a little chilly as we move closer and closer to the cooler weather of the winter that is ahead of us. But nevertheless, it's a good day to be with you. God, uh, I pray, has blessed you and you are serving him with all the vim and vigor that you possibly could have for your Lord. The Swedish pop group ABBA, if you remember that, some of us with this white stuff would remember that, was formed in Stockholm in 1972 and became one of the best-selling acts in the history of pop music. And they topped the charts from about 1974 to 1982. And the estimated record sales for ABBA range anywhere from 150 to over 300 million sold worldwide. I'm not sure why they don't have an exact figure. But we know that ABBA became the best-selling Swedish band of all time. And the best-selling band originating in the continental Europe. And the net, net worth of what is called the ABBA group is over 900 million. And the group has four members, and each of those members' net worth is anywhere from 200 to 300 million. And it was on November 1st, 1976. I don't remember that year. That was a long time ago. But I remember the song that they released, Money, Money, Money. Now, the song itself is the story of a woman who, despite of all her hard work, could not save any money. And this monetary lack resulted in her desire to find a wealthy man. Now I want to read some of, those, some, of those, some of the lyrics to you. And it goes like this. The song again is called Money, Money, Money. I work all night. I work all day to pay the bills I have to pay. Ain't it sad? And still there never seems to be a single penny left for me. That's too bad. In my dreams I have a plan. If I got me a wealthy man... I wouldn't have to work at all. I'd fool around and have a ball. Money, money, money. Must be funny. It's the rich man's world. Money, money, money. Always sunny in the rich man's world. All the things I could do if I had a little money. It's a rich man's world. C.S. Lewis, in his fiction, his book of his fiction, The Screw Tape Letters, uh, writes, quote, prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it, while really it is finding its place in him. Charles Dickens' character Ebenezer Scrooge in the Christmas in the Carol, Christmas Carol, said, quote, what's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer. Jesus said to his disciples and the crowds on the mount, you cannot serve God and money. Please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And that's where we're going to be today. We're going to read from verse 19 to 34 together. 19 to 34, chapter 6 of Matthew's Gospel. <clears throat> Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? 
And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today, which today, pardon me, is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Father, we just thank you for this word, this uh, word of your son on that day on the mount to his disciples and the Jewish crowds by the hundreds and maybe even thousands around him. Lord, we thank you for it. May we understand what, what you would teach us about money and wealth and materialism and all those things. Jesus talked about these things a lot and we need to understand them for our own time and place. So help us to understand this, Lord, Holy Spirit, the living God, give us insight and wisdom and direct us in the way we should go. For your glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we return to where we started three weeks ago in our sermon series, The Heart Sayings of Jesus. We find ourselves back at the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' disciples and, and the crowds around Jesus gathered to hear Jesus teach. So from chapter 5 to 7, Jesus revealed the, the very essence, the nature, and the reality of the kingdom of God. And in many ways, what Jesus said to those folks about the kingdom of God so long ago would have really upset the apple cart, if you will, the status quo of the first century Jewish audience. We can see this clearly in chapter 5 when Jesus would begin his teaching with, you have heard it, you have heard it was said, or it was also said. Then Jesus would say things like this, um, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. That's the 29th verse of Matthew 5. Or if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also, uh, Matthew 5.39. Or love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, Matthew 5.44. So what was Jesus doing here in his sermon? Well, a number of things. But he was, he was certainly pointing out how far short his audience had come to meet the commandments of God. The religious leadership of the day, and, and for that matter, many of, of the Jewish folks in those days, had turned God's law into a law of rules, a sort of a man-centered law of rules, if you will. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. This is in now, this is out now. You know, if you're tracking with the seers, we remember what Jesus said, that if one wants to enter into the kingdom of God, one will need to enter by the narrow gate. That's in chapter 7, we looked at that. Chapter 7, verse 14. For of course, the, the gate into the kingdom of heaven is narrow, but it leads to the kingdom of God. It is the hard way, the way of opposition but it's the only way to life, Jesus would say. But his audience had bought into the easy way, that wide gate that Jesus talks about. Do this, do that, and do it most of the time, and, well, all will be good with you and God. You see, one can really earn their way into God's good, God's good graces. In our text today, we find here four important teachings that Jesus taught his disciples and the crowds, and that we must understand as well. And here's why we must understand us, and understand what Jesus is teaching here. And I want to bring you back to what we've already learned in this series in Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said of those who call themselves followers of Jesus, he said this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. See, Jesus gives us a choice, folks. You can have the world, and all that's in it, or you can have him, but not both, one or the other. 
If you choose the world, Jesus said you will forfeit your soul. You can choose you or you can choose Jesus. If you choose you, Jesus said you will lose your life. If you choose Jesus, you will find your life. Here in our text, Jesus teaches, one, about treasures, verse 19 to 21. Two, a healthy eye, verse 22 to 23. Three, serving God or serving money, verse 24. And four, worry, verse 25 to 34. So one, two, and three are on one side of the coin. And we can call that money, wealth, materialism, and consumerism in our day. All of that packaged in there together. And four, the worry part, is the other side of the same coin that we have. And here we have food, water, clothing, shelter, the necessities we all need. Again, when we're looking at an ancient text, sometimes we have to put on our first century hats, and let's do that for a moment. We'll put our first century hats on. And in this first century sen uh, setting, it's good to, we need to know that a good wage for the common laborer was a denarii a day, about a penny a day. When we consider yearly income for the adults of, in that day, 50 denarii would have been the standard of living required to meet the basics of life. Now, the temptation for you and me is to try and make a comparison today. We can do that, but remember, this is the first century, not today. So let's avoid that. But we can't say for sure, we can understand this, that there would be no margin with this kind of income. Not a lot of give and take. For indeed, poverty and lack were very common in Jesus' day. More common than in our day. Now let's put back on our 21st century hats. Because there's a couple of elephants wandering around in the video here. I don't know how they fit in here. It's a little tiny screen I'm looking at. But there's a couple of elephants that we need to identify and just speak out loud about them. First elephant. Jesus was and is not a socialist. He didn't preach a social, socialistic ideology. And I, I really can't go any further than that, so I have to leave that there. I need to, I need to identify that. Two... Jesus does not preach that money, wealth, material things are evil. For they are not evil in themselves. So what did Jesus teach about our earthly treasures? Why, why don't we take a look? We'll start with verse 19. And please notice with me the verse, I mean the phrase in verse 19, do not lay up. Now lay up is a verb and it's presented here in a negative sense because of the leading with do not. And also this verb is an imperative, it's a command. And the force of that command or that imperative in this verb is represented with the negative, do not. So we could say it in a different way, which would probably help make sense of it. Stop storing up treasures in heaven. Jesus is saying, stop storing up treasures. Stop storing, oh boy, stop storing up treasures on earth. I know I said heaven, pardon me for that. Why? We have to ask why. Because anything we accumulate in this world is subject to what Jesus said here, moth and rust. Moth and rust. Now, moths in the day of Jesus, and I think we understand a little bit about this now, but in that day were universally known as a destructive force. Uh, in other words, uh, moths aren't good for your clothes. They would put holes in them. They weren't good for a lot of other things, too. But it's also interesting to note that the word rust in their text here can also be translated worm. So our earthly treasures are subject to destruction. Hence the word destroy here in verse 19. And this word destroy means uh, to snatch out of sight. It means to put out of view, to make unseen, and even to corrupt. So here's the point. This is what Jesus is saying to us. You can stack up as much wealth and material things as you want. Go for it. Go ahead. Go with all gusto. But know this, all of it is temporary. All of it is subject to be snatched out of your hands at a moment's notice. Nothing, my friends, of this world is permanent. Not a single thing. And when we die, which we all will, 
we leave the world the same way we came into it. We brought nothing into the world and we leave in the same way. Looking at verse 21, we see this very same verb again, lay up. But here, it's used in the positive sense. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. So again, we ask the question, why? Well, Jesus would say, said, treasures in heaven are not subject to the moth and the worm. The moth and the worm cannot snatch away the heavenly treasures. Matter of fact, unlike the earthly treasures, which thieves can break in and steal, thieves cannot break in and steal the heavenly treasure. So we put back on our first century hats, and what we know is that in the first century, it would be much easier for a burglar to break into a mud brick home than into the our homes in our 21st century. The word break literally means dig through. Friends, any treasures that we store in heaven are more secure than the gold in Fort Knox, more secure than any Swiss bank account. So now we need to ask, what are these treasures in heaven that Jesus was speaking about? Well, let's look to the Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy, his first letter to Timothy for commentary. There Paul was addressing the rich believers, the well-to-do believers in the Ephesian church, and he said this to Timothy, to tell these rich believers this. Quote, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, and ready to share. That's chapter 6 of his first letter, 17 and 18. In doing so, Paul said, they would be storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. What treasures? Well, for the rich in Ephesus, it was to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share. But it was more than good works and more than sharing. It was not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Where would they put their hope? Where would they to put their hope? On God. You see, Jesus and Paul understood what we need to understand that materialism can blind us from God's truth. See, one doesn't have to be wealthy to be rich in good works or generous and willing to share. Yet materialism can blind all of us. God knows this, for Jesus even said here in verse 24, you cannot serve God and money. You know, it's a funny thing that humans do when dealing with the matters of the heart. You know, that internal place of, that describes who we are. We can almost justify anything to make ourselves feel better or do something that we want to do. We deflect the real thing going on in our hearts. And when it comes to material possession, Christians have and do, do justify the value they place on material possessions. They say things like, everyone does it, you know, everyone gets money builds up wealth, or other people do it more than I do, or with our noses in the air, it's my responsibility to leave a legacy for my kids. Well, that may be true. It's really the attitude of the heart that we're talking about there, isn't it? All the while, by saying these things, they still disobey the clear teachings of Christ. Folks, try as, mu as much as we can. We can't fool, we can't justify, hide anything from God, because Jesus said this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Apostle Paul said that you and I are created in Christ for what? Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, uh, 10. See, folks, whether one is rich or not is not the point. Our work, our spending, our attitudes regarding money and wealth will reflect what is in our hearts. For Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Moving into verse 22 and 23, we have what I really think is a perplexing statement for us 21 century individuals. 
Here Jesus is using figurative language and some wordplay really to transition to his point that he's trying to make here in verse 24. And it goes to something like this. I'll try my best. The one who is single-minded, Jesus is saying, in his devotion to God is the one who has set his heart on the things of God. That person can see clearly. He, that person has an accurate outlook regarding material wealth. That person has a healthy eye. But the other person that Jesus described here has an unhealthy eye. Unhealthy eye. And they are walking in darkness. And they have a poor outlook regarding material wealth. And that person is the opposite of a generous person. That person is a greedy person, a selfish person, with the potential to do great harm to themselves and to others. And this brings us right into verse 24. And again, we put on a first century hat, because here now we're encountering the language of master and slave, which for the most part here in the West is foreign to us today. Nonetheless, we keep this in mind. We know that verse 24 is not to be separated from verse 22 and 23. And 23. Jesus here is continuing with his original thought. Either your eye is healthy or is it not, or it is not. You can't serve two masters. You see, a first century slave belonged to one master and only to that one master. His loyalty or her loyalty was to that one master and none other. Anything else would cause division. Your devotion would be divided. Your affections would be divided. Your allegiance would be divided. Your priorities would even be divided. Jesus said you could not serve God in money. Here we have a contrast between God and money. But money is put on the same level there. If you look at that word, God and money, that phrase. You see, the original word is the Aramaic word mammon, which is used for money or properties. And because Jesus put it in contrast with God, money becomes, as one commentator put it, deified as well as personified. Deified as well as personified. Maybe you remember last week we were in Matthew 16, verse 26, where Jesus said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soil? Soul. Jesus here in verse 24 applies the principle we find in Matthew 16, 26 to the idolatry of materialism. Folks, when we serve money, when we serve materialism instead of God, it becomes our idol. I don't know if you remember the parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter uh, 12, verse 13 and 20. Someone went up to uh, Jesus from the crowd and said, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus said to the man, who, who made me judge or arbiter over you? And then he said this very interesting thing to this person. He said, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. Then he tells a parable. There's this man who, who was rich. He had a, lots of land. It produced plenty. And this man thought to himself, Jesus said, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. Then he said to himself, Well, you know what I'll do? I'll do this. I will tear down my barns and I'll build even bigger barns, larger ones. And I will store all my grains and my goods in there. And then I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, and be merry. Enjoy yourself. But uh, the parable goes like this. God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So, this is the, is, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. If you serve money, materialism, all that stuff, instead of God, it becomes your idol. Well, we take all that Jesus said here now, verse 19 to 24, we bring it into 25 to 34. And now I just want to quote one commentator to try and make a connection there for us. Let's we'll see if it works. This commentator said this, quote, It is a profound implication that the way we use our riches has on our hearts. If we store up money because we are worried about our security, it is only going to inflame our anxiety. Now, if you don't, still don't see the connection here, 
Jesus was teaching about the relationship of a faithful servant in the kingdom of God, faithfully serving their king. That's that master-slave thing that we found in verse 19 and 24. Jesus, in these remaining verses, highlights God's commitment to take care of his faithful servants. Jesus here was addressing the necessities all persons require. Food, water, clothing, shelter. And Jesus uses the word anxious, which is also translated worry in some of your translations, like the NIV, six times. Let's pay attention to that. And also notice that the phrase, the phrase, your heavenly father, Jesus uses here in this text. And it should be clear to you and me that these verses are almost solely about God's provision and care for the necessities of your life and my life. Food, water, clothing, and shelter. And here's the point, friends. God promises the basics. And the key word is basics. The question is, do you believe this? Or do you worry about these things? Let me ask this in a different way. Are you a servant of God? Are you a follower of Christ? Yes? No? You see, in some Christian circles, it gets kind of weird. Christians are taught to seek material gain. That God promises that you and me would have great wealth and good health. The servant of God would have, no, should have no lack, no need. And I wonder how that teaching that is common these days squares with the teaching that Jesus is giving us here in our text today. And if you were to be honest and have a good look at the so-called Christian wealth and health teaching, it really reveals that the ones on the top are living their best life now. Everyone else wishes they were like that. In many ways, it's not different than any multi-level uh, scheme. You just replicate, rep reproduce the upline, and you will have the greater wealth. Well, friends, to me, that's a bunch of hogwash. It's claptrap. It's contrary to the teaching of Jesus, clearly here just in Matthew 6. God promises his servants the basics. Do you believe this? So here's the bottom line. God has the power to provide for our needs. We don't have to worry about that. But not only has the power, but he guarantees to meet our needs. God guarantees us. Because this is where the prosperity gospel twists things. If you don't have those things, the greater things even, then your faith is no good. This is where our culture twists things. It makes it more about the stuff than the heart. Jesus gives us an example here in this text of his Father's provision from creation. Jesus said, Our Heavenly Father feeds the birds, verse 26. And are, not, and are you, are and I, not of more value than they? Our Heavenly Father, Jesus says, fills the fields with beautiful lilies, more glorious than even Solomon in all his grandeur. These are here today and then thrown in the furnace tomorrow. Will he not much more clothe you and shelter you? Verse 30. Do you see what Jesus is saying, my friends? You worry and worry and worry, just like your pagan neighbor. And in all that worrying, can you really add one more hour to your life? Are you paying more attention to your earthly portfolio, your stuff? Are you always looking towards tomorrow? Thank God it's Friday. You see, Jesus is right. When he said sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Why borrow on tomorrow's trouble? The only thing you and I will gain from borrowing from tomorrow's trouble is more worry. And our eyes will be taken off God uh, who has the power and has the promises to you and me to take care of our lives and our needs. I just want to leave you with some questions. Where is your treasure? Are you serving God? Or has money and stuff become your God? You know, like that woman in that song, Money, Money, Money? All the things I could do if I had a little money. Is your priority the kingdom of God? Or is it worry, worry, worry? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your tender care. 
and your promises. Oh Lord, may we just may we just accept that you are better at caring for us than we are. That we would just bow down to you, not to this world's promise of power and wealth and equity and equality, which they can never meet. No, Lord, to you who promised to take care of your faithful servants. And may we be faithful servants. I pray for my brothers and my sisters who are struggling today with finances because of the inflation. Oh, God, bring that promise to bear in their situation. Help us to help our neighbors to give with something that we have that they don't have. Help us to be kind with that and generous. Not because we're rich with money, but because we're rich with our treasures in heaven. Oh Lord, help us to do that. You know, Lord, the church today in the West spends billions of dollars on buildings. On buildings. Oh Lord, may we be... We may be reminded that buildings is not the church. That your people are the church. And it doesn't matter where we gather in what kind of building. What matters is that we gather, that we worship you, and that we be like your son Jesus and go and help people to enter into the kingdom of heaven and give of our time and our talent and our treasures for the kingdom of heaven. I pray, Lord, we do this for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Shalom.